grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this most holy of nights. We gather late on this Christmas Eve to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, to marvel at the miracle of God made flesh, and to revel in the joy of this season. I thank you for joining me for this contemplative worship service. I hope that you will find this as a time to take a deep breath at the end of a busy Advent season before the morning joy of Christmas. I pray that you will find in these moments a chance to truly celebrate the joy of Christ's birth and the miracle of God's grace at work in this world and at work in your life. Friends, let us worship God together. Please join me in the call to worship. The glory of the Lord shines around us. The angels tell the story. Do not fear, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy. A child has been born for us, a son given to us. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to all on earth. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place. Let us glorify the one who is the Messiah, the Lord. Come, let us adore him. Let us worship God. Even on this most holy of nights, it is impossible for us to deny the presence of sin in the world. We need simply look at the world around us to see the pain and devastation brought on by sin. And it is impossible to deny that we have contributed. But as followers of Christ, we place our faith in the promises of God to be slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So let us confess our sins. First in silence, let us pray.
Let us also unite our voices confessing together. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ you came among us as light shining in the darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to the glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. Forgive our doubt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. God's promise is this, nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God, most truly embodied in a child lying in a manger. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. We would make room for you this night of all nights, dear Lord, room in our minds and hearts. Let your word be born in us anew, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your splendor shines in us and through us. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this evening comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses Two through seven. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. And our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. 
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all of these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I mentioned in a sermon a few weeks ago that Claire and I broke down and got our Christmas tree early this year. We did this partly because that was when the tree became available and partly because we felt like we needed a little bit of extra joy this season. Perhaps you did the same thing. I know that we weren't alone in doing this. Heidi Heverkamp is an Episcopal priest. She wrote a reflection for the Christian century that stuck out to me as particularly meaningful this year. I'd like to read it for you this evening. Heidi writes these words. One November, on a cross-country drive, I fell in love with the tradition of setting candles in windows. The sun went down before 5 o'clock p.m., and as we drove along the narrow, winding roads of eastern Ohio, the dark hills were lit by a surprising number of such candles, winking warmly at strangers and passers-by along the way. I never forgot that feeling of welcome and glowing hope at such a dark time of year in a place I didn't know, and I have been a devoted user of window candles ever since. So devoted, in fact, that when my husband and I replaced the old knob and tube wiring in our last house, we made sure to install an outlet under each window that looks out on the street. In cold climates, batteries and window candles go dead faster than you can blink. The house was a brick colonial on a corner lot, perfect for window candles, two stories with two matching windows on each of them, Instagram gold, especially after a snowfall. Legend traces this tradition back to Mary and Joseph marching, searching for a place to stay, as well as to that of a star leading the Magi on a long journey through a strange country. I don't know about you, but It's not hard to feel as though I'm journeying through a strange country every single day. Perhaps feeling the same way, many folks in my social media feed have talked about putting up their Christmas decorations earlier than usual. My cousin in Dallas put the lights up on her family's house on October 7th this year. They are a bulwark against the gloom, whether it's the shorter days the chaos of the news, or the loneliness of ongoing social distancing. This year, decorations feel like like an act of resistance. Gloom is not foreign to the nativity story. Scripture tells us Jesus' birth was a time not only of joy and welcome, but of fear, violence, and catastrophe. We tend not to focus on these bits as we hear the story read in church or watch the children's pageant. No Room at the Inn is often played as a comedy rather than as a stomach-churning situation for a pregnant mother and a father. We dodge the presence of Augustus Caesar, the emperor looming in the background, or his ruthlessness and absolute power over the Roman Empire and its people. 
We brush by King Herod, his threats, the massacre of the innocents, and the flight to Egypt. This year, however, all of these grim and terrible plot turns are what get my attention. They sound less like the plot of a fairy tale or news reports from another country or what we used to call biblical scenarios and more like current and near possible events. And somehow, for me, this is heartening because I need even more to know that Jesus is with us, that these sorts of events are not shocking to God, as so much that seemed unbreakable has broken apart in this world. The tradition of window candles reminds me of the old proverb, it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. I think of the service of Easter Vigil in my tradition and others, where a candle is brought into a dark church. Three times a deacon chants, the light of Christ, and three times the congregation chants in response, thanks be to God. And I think, of course, of our Christmas readings from Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and from John 1, what has come into being in him was the life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Setting out lights this year, for me, is proclaiming the power and love of Christ, which I am trying so hard to continue to put my trust in. I want to feel hope, not in the sense of having a good attitude or looking on the bright side, but hope as holding fast to the deep down belief that God's love is stronger than evil or violence or death. Hope is also an action verb. So I'll light my candle instead of cursing the darkness, but that's not all I'll do. Window candles do not change policy or rebuild governments or feed the hungry or protect the vulnerable. But symbols and, and decorations have power nonetheless. They can be prophetic. They can be inspiration to keep on keeping on. They can be a shield against the despair. We ended up moving this year, so we sold the house with its perfect rows of windows and conveniently located electrical outlets. Our new home is a ranch with an asymmetrical assortment of small, medium, and picture windows, and there aren't enough outlets. But I'm sure we'll figure it out with the grace of God and a few extension cords, because the light does shine in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Friends, in spite of the changes of this season, in spite of the burdens that we carry, and the worries that rest on our souls, I encourage you to take these words to heart. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome the light. May this be true this night in the world and in your life. Amen.
siblings in Christ, we gather on this night wherever we are, united by our love of God and by God's grace at work in our lives. When we gather around this table, I am not the host, you are not the host, Jesus Christ is the host, and Christ welcomes all people. Where we might establish boundaries or erect barriers, Christ opens wide his loving arms. No matter who we are, no matter where we are from, no matter what baggage or burdens we bring to this table, Christ proclaims that this meal is for us. So on this night, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, let us remember in this sacrament the love which he offered to all people, which he offers to you and to me. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup. Empower us by your Spirit to be Christ's presence in the world, even as Jesus was Emmanuel. Give us courage to speak his truth, to seek his justice, and to love with his love. Amen. On the night when our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat of drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our risen Lord. Wherever you are this evening, I invite you to locate communion elements, bread and cup, and share them with those with whom you've gathered. Friends, these are the gifts of God. They are for us, the people of God. Solid
Let us pray. Great God of power, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came to save us from our sins. We thank you for the hope of the prophets, the songs of the angels, and the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. We thank you that in Jesus you became flesh and dwelt among us, sharing human hurts and pleasures. Great God, we offer glory to you for your grace-filled love expressed in the sharing of this bread and cup. Strengthen us to be your people at work in your world each and every day. Amen. I now invite you to find and light your candles as we prepare to sing Silent Night together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was the life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. May the light of Christ kindle within your life the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And may you bear that light into the world. Amen.